Welcome into a Labor Day edition of In Touch with Indiana Sports, powered by HoosierIllustrated.com. Hope you're having a great long weekend. If you are somebody who gets to participate in the extra day off of work, there are not many good things or things as good as a Monday off of work, especially whenever it lands on the first weekend of college football. And uh, the remnants of fall are back, too. So that kind of adds to the the atmosphere, if you will. So all the heat's gone. I hope it's gone for good this time. I know we'll still have some warm days ahead, but I'd be really happy if the uh, the humidity begin to die, began to die down. We kept seeing highs in the low 80s at most. As we slowly start to inch our way into the fall season, you know, we'll start getting the temperatures that I'm that I live for. Give me those mid to lower 70s, even the upper 60s if the sun's out. That's the the sweet spot right there. So happy Monday, happy Labor Day. Indiana football got their first win of the Kurt Signetti era over the weekend. And uh, it was a fun watch. It was it was a good week, good weekend of college football in general, I should say. And um, my my betting picks, none of them hit except for I had a, I had a I had one come out on top for me at the very end. It was last night. I took USC money line to kind of get me back on track. So shout out to the USC Trojans for getting it done against LSU and helping me not have a poor betting weekend because I was I was down bad after all of the correct picks in week zero and then. Since then, since I started actually wagering, because I didn't wager on week zero games, I was missing everything. So shout out to the Trojans for getting me back in the uh, win column when it comes to that stuff. Good conversation with Mitchell Page. I'm going to get into here in just a moment because we're going to recap all things Indiana football from the weekend. And uh, we kind of take a turn a little about halfway through the conversation, talking a little bit about some attendance issues with with Indiana football and the big picture and that type of stuff. And it's a pretty good conversation. I'm looking forward to sharing that with you guys here on a Labor Day Monday. And then um, we'll go over some week one results, some of the big results from the weekend in college football. And then also talk very little. Not There's not a whole lot to really share in terms of detail with this, but Jalen Harrelson was in town this weekend for Indiana basketball for the Indiana football game, of course, but on a visit for Indiana basketball. And obviously that's a very important name to keep an eye on if you are an Indiana basketball fan. So we'll dive into that towards the end. But I guess without further ado, we'll go ahead and start recapping a little Indiana football. Their win over Florida International 31-7. to We'll bring in our man Mitchell Page, and you'll hear both my thoughts, his thoughts, really just kind of a complete recap of how we feel about this team right now and moving into the rest of the season. And um, there's some good stuff there. So without further ado, here's our man, Mitchell Page. Joining me now for the first time for hopefully many Mondays and hopefully for a lot of positive reasons, it is our man, Mitchell Page. Welcome in. Happy Labor Day, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. It's always good to celebrate a little holiday after some Hoosier victory in uh, as convinc- a convincing a fashion as they did on Saturday. Maybe it wasn't the prettiest, but convincing is a good word. And that's fine. And then one thing we talked about as we we did our own little post-game show, myself and Kyler Staley back over the weekend, I hate to use the old cliche, but I feel like there's no better way to describe it as in it was really just a tale of two different halves. The team looked really polished, especially on offense in the early two quarters of the game. You did have that slip up on defense towards the very end. But other than that one little slip up, that's the only true sign of weakness that we saw from the defense all night long. And when you consider what we were expecting going in, a lot of people thought that the offense was ahead of the defense when really it kind of seems like it's the other way around, at least from this very small sample size that we get in game one. Yeah, but what I'll say, excuse me, gosh, it's always a lot easier to gel as a defense than it is an offense, I think. Um, And the reason for that is offense requires so much timing, especially in the passing game. That's all going to come. You've got a bunch of new guys. You've got a brand-new quarterback in a brand-new system. 
they've done it all spring. They did it all fall camp, but it's just at a different speed when bullets are flying for real. And this was their first time to go out there and do it. They hit on some things early. They looked really solid. They had some good plays, but then they just got a little out of sync is really all that happened. It, it looked like we weren't seeing it as fast and who knows what adjustments FIU made. You know, I'm not dissecting the film with those guys. So maybe they did something that's a little bit different and it just changed up the look and it got us a little bit out of our rhythm. What's really important is even though we are out of rhythm, a lot of times in Indiana's history, you get out of rhythm on offense and you really just don't do anything with it. You punt it after three plays almost every time. It never felt like <clears throat> we were going backwards. We were in, like not intimidated is the wrong word, but it never felt like I, I think I kind of get what you're saying and forgive me if I'm wrong, but it never felt like FIU ever stole any true momentum away. from Yes, in this even game. though we were, I mean, truly sputtering, we, we could not find rhythm and momentum on offense. We just it didn't seem like we were getting right there and then it just wouldn't click. The fire wouldn't start. But we never gave the game away. That game never felt like Indiana was ever going to lose it. We maybe weren't didn't feel like we were going to win it 60 to nothing anymore. Yeah. But we were going to win by three, four touchdowns from the beginning of the game all the way through the end of the game. We had a grip on it the whole time. It never was in doubt. And that's what you're looking for in a week one game against an opponent that, you know, that other teams around the country that are supposed to be a lot better than us had a lot more trouble with a lot less teams. So you you look at a week one game and say, oh, gosh, the spread was whatever it was. Why didn't we win by a zillion? They covered, by the way. So, I mean, that, that counts for something if you bet on it. I'll say right. this real quick. I bet the over and I guess, you know, just from taking the betting side out of it, I'm glad that the over didn't hit. Unless you're just talking about you wish Indiana scored more points. But when I bet the over, I was assuming this would be closer to more of a shootout style where it's like 42 to 24, that type of game. 100%. And it wasn't that. This was a chokehold from the defense. It, it, I, I think there was a lot of worry about the FIU quarterback, as there should be, a mobile guy that can throw it. They can get things going pretty quick. And in that style of offense with a running quarterback – that is able to keep drives alive as a defense, you can get pinned down and on your heels really quickly. And it felt like Indiana was on the front foot the whole game. It felt like we controlled the line of scrimmage. We dictated what was going to happen when our defense was on the field. And that's really what you're looking for. They, there was so much positive that I took from a week one game with a brand new coach, brand new quarterback, brand new offense, defense, the whole thing, the, whole, the building looks different top to bottom. There's probably a handful of people in the whole program that were there last year outside of some players, right? You're talking complete overhaul of the staff at weight room, meal staff, coaches. Everything is different than it was 365 days ago at this time. When you have that much change, you have to expect there's going to be uh, some influidity in the first game. But you're hoping that they come out and and set the tone and establish that they're going to be big and bad and control the line of scrimmage first and foremost, which they did consistently throughout the game, offense and defense. As a former wide receiver yourself, I'm sure it was cool for you to see really just a myriad of different players participate in this first game. And the highlight wasn't even Donovan McCulley. And unfortunately, he got injured early on, and hopefully it's nothing too serious. I know he's questionable going into week two. And mm -hmm. honestly, whether he's 100% or not, Western Illinois is probably a game that if it is questionable, you don't want to risk further injuring it. So you may not see mm -hmm. Donovan McCulley next week. But that aside, you got good games from Omar Cooper, the tight end, Zach Horton. Miles Cross had probably the craziest catch of the entire day where it looked like he pulled it in out of nowhere. I think that was a Sports Center top 10, if I'm not Number mistaken. Number three by the way. this morning. It okay, was yeah. stunning. I watched it four times just to get my eyes focused. What it was even happening. <laughs> that ball was nowhere near him. That's a catch 0% of the time. And to have an athlete like that that's big and can go make that kind of play, just another positive thing. Thing that you see okay there's some potential here and then the other side of the offense that one thing we haven't really we haven't been able to gush about it really since the days when you were playing Mitchell back in the Kevin Wilson era the running game was probably the most powerful part of the offense altogether 
the offensive line pr- played really well. Maybe not so much when it comes to pass protection, as I talked about over the weekend, but when it comes to making holes for the running backs, and you might think about that Elijah Green 50-plus yard touchdown run towards the end of the game is maybe the highlight of the day for them. It was really cool to finally see the rushing game really kind of be the focal point for the Indiana offense for the first time in a while. Yeah, and it's funny you talk about offense versus defense, what's easier to get in rhythm early. Run blocking and pass blocking are kind of similar. Pass blocking is a lot more communication. It's a lot more scheme. You're backing up. You're sorting to different players as the defensive line is shifting. You're getting blitzers. Run blocking is a mindset. I'm bigger and better than you, and I'm going to push you around. It's a lot easier to have one of those mindsets, right? It's a lot easier as a run blocker to just go and hit somebody versus let them come to you and sort what you're doing. It's almost like left brain versus right brain. Exactly. Two different types of protections. You'll see, (laughs) I'm anticipating, you will see such a huge improvement from week one to week two now that you've had some bullets flying at you in quarterback and receiver timing and anticipation. And then an offensive line sorting and pass pro. It it always, every year, those are the two hardest things, I think, for a football team to really get gelling and get moving. Even when you have an experienced quarterback, even when we had Nate Sudfeld back there, it's still, it's just a different season with different looks, different offensive linemen, different receivers. It just takes you a little bit of time. Now, a good quarterback can accelerate that, which I think Curtis Rourke is. But it was also his first game in the program. So you have to give... Week one, go with what you know. Go with what you're good at. We're bigger. We're better. We're going to run the ball right at your face, which they did very successfully over and over again to, I mean, you talk about it just never felt like the game was in doubt. And I'll tell you what, Tyson Lawton, he's probably the first time, and maybe it could just be the first game excitement with me saying this, but. Tyson Lawton looked like a Big Ten running back, and I feel like we haven't seen that from Indiana, again, since back to whenever you were playing, guys like Jordan Howard. And I'm not trying to say Tyson Lawton's going to be like Jordan Howard. It's just been a while since we've seen somebody who looks like he is that much better than everyone else on the field. Yeah, I mean, he's big, and he runs really hard. When it's when the play is quote-unquote over, I think one of my – I mean, we talk about Jordan Howard. I think there was one guy I'm totally blanking – for Indiana. Divine Redding was around that same time. Yeah, but he was more of a little scat back. I'm talking in our the 2020 year who played running back for Indiana. Oh goodness. Why, Why is I, it hard? To, some oh, it's funny everybody remembers that obviously as the Penix year. Yes, I'm the blanking. Year. The run that the running back that year was phenomenal and he was this way what I'm about to say when the play was quote unquote over he sticks his foot in the ground and falls forward for two three extra ones. And and that's that's so valuable to an offense. I mean, we all I can talk about is my own experience, but you talk about the difference between Tevin Coleman and Jordan Howard. Tevin Coleman as a running back in a vacuum, probably a better player, a better running back. He could score. He was fast. He was big, strong. But Jordan Howard was arguably better for our offense as a whole because when it was time to put his foot in the ground, he always fell forward. He always got three or four extra. When you gave him the ball on first down – it was going to be second and six at worst versus Tevin Coleman sometimes might get tackled in the backfield. He might run for 90 yards in a touchdown, but second and 11 closes your playbook up so much more. And it feels like they've got a couple guys that are that way that can help the offense continue to be on schedule and keep the entire playbook open. Because I guarantee we saw about half of the things that we're going to see in week six in terms of uh, spreading the ball, allowing the playbook to be open, giving the keys truly to Curtis Rourke. He had never played in the Big Ten. We didn't know what we were going to get out of that guy. Um, hoping for good Even things. Even saw a couple of trick plays. We saw Ty- Tyson Lawton throw a pass, which <laughs> I heard the, uh, the announcers saying, I think they were on point. Without the the wide receiver gloves or whatever you want to call them, he might have been able to make a better throw with that. I don't know. I threw it a lot better with gloves on. I can remember okay. I, threw, huh. I threw one to uh, – to Simi Cobbs in the pinstripe bowl, hit him right in the numbers, and then I threw that ball to Rich Lego with gloves on. It's I I think he rushed it. He saw how wide okay. open he was. Like this is going to be a touchdown pass. All he had to do was set his feet for two seconds and just loft it. <laughs> and it just it's funny when everything's happening so quickly and you're not a quarterback. I know from experience, you see a guy that's wide open. You're like, this is gonna I 
already doing a touchdown dance. This is going to, I can't wait to talk about this in 20 <laughs> years. And then you just get a little rushed is all that happened. Um, but I like it. They look like they're having fun. But when I, I'm more talking about like down the field throws where you build in these deep combinations, you're set in pass pro. You've got guys up front that understand what they're doing. They've done it now a couple games. We're sorting to different blitzes. And that gives the quarterback three and a half seconds instead of three seconds. And it allows your receivers to get to those deep digs, the deep crossers, to where you start challenging safeties, challenging cornerbacks, and putting pressure down the field. I don't think Indiana really needed to do that because they established the uh, the line of scrimmage felt like when the ball was snapped, it was three yards ahead of where it started every play. So we didn't really have to go at them, but in the big 10, we're going to have to do that. And I, no. I think you'll just see the offense evolve to eventually getting to a point where it's a, a lot sturdier, sturdier up front. And we're taking some of those deep throws, maybe not double posts every play the way that we did when I was there, but <laughs> You're going to start seeing the ball being thrown down the field because we have so much talent at wide receiver. It was glaring how much skill there is on the outside for Indiana. Uh, was the name we were forgetting Stevie Scott? Yes. I pulled up the roster because I was like, we got to figure out who this is. Real quick. Yes, Stevie Scott. And I can I could picture his face. I can picture him uh, at Mi – we were playing Michigan the year they beat him, and he scores a touchdown. I can picture him flexing. I just couldn't get – the back of the jersey. All I could he was number eight, right? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Yeah, I can picture his face, the front of his jersey. I just can't get the back of it when he runs back to jog my memory. Big picture stuff. And I know it's only a very, very small sample size. Mm -hmm. But could you tell anything really just from watching from, and, you know, I don't want to call you an outsider's perspective, but from, you know, not being a part of the team, what could you tell – differently from what we've gotten used to with Tom Allen teams versus this first sample with Kurt Signetti. Yeah. I, I think we need a couple more games to understand yeah. how the team is different, but it was pretty obvious how different the coach is. Uh, oh my gosh. The amount of, I mean, he is obviously, so both Tom Allen and Kurt Signetti have very, very, I don't even know, I guess, I don't want to say flamboyant personalities. They'll have very unique personalities. It's probably the best way to say it, but yes. they're polar opposites. There yes. were so many times watching the BTM broadcast where they would zoom in on Signetti's face, and he just looks like he smelled the nastiest fart you'd ever seen. Ever. And then you have the, uh, the halftime interview with the BTN guy, and he asks – Signetti, what he thinks the mess or what the message to the locker room is going to be. He takes about a second and a half pause. He looks at the camera, he laughs, and then he walks away. And it was and a serial killer laugh. It wasn't <laughs> it like, really was. yeah, like that's a guy that's got a weird thing on his mind. He's, I almost have to change the channel. This is totally honest. When he's getting interviewed, I don't feel comfortable. It makes you uncomfortable. Do, do you feel like he, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but do you feel like he's probably somebody that a lot of people have a hard time communicating with, like having a one-on-one -on -one conversation? Yes. That's that's the way that – and I don't think that's a bad thing. I, okay. I, I think unless you're talking about football or what he's trying to do, it feels like he really doesn't care about what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, and even if you are talking about his team – if you're not in his staff, if you're not on his team, it feels like he just doesn't have enough room in his brain to think about what you're saying. He just doesn't care. And He's a football robot. In football, you bet. That like he was born to be a football coach and that's all he knows. It'd be interesting. I he is quickly rising to the top of my list of people that I want in a foursome at golf oh. just because you don't <laughs> he's a guy and one day hopefully I'll tell him this maybe I don't know if he's a golfer or not but it feels like he's a guy that you tell we're just gonna you stay here we're just gonna play through on like the second hole and just leave him because he's weird <laughs> or he's gonna be someone that you want every week in your game every day of the week and I don't think there's anywhere in the middle where he just kind of exists. I think he's one of two things. And I think that that's going to really help him in recruiting. Uh, if we're talking back to football, 
because he's not going to waste time and he's not going to mince words. And the guys that come to Indiana are going to understand what they're getting into. And I think it eliminates a lot of the, the nonsense that can sometimes go when you add a bunch of fluff. I don't believe there's a lot of fluff in the program right now. I think there's one mission. And I, <laughs> if you asked him, I bet he would want a bunch of, you use football robot, I think that's exactly right. He would want 120 robots that come in, <laughs> watch film, class as a maybe, let's go win on Saturday. <laughs> like that's that's what it feels like we have. We'll learn a lot more about the team itself, but he's a character, man. He is a character. I don't mean to get ahead of ourselves, but did you happen to watch any of UCLA versus Hawaii last night? Yeah. A UCLA better get better real quick. Yeah. Because, I mean, if, if I'm I'm not betting on the game just yet, but I'll probably bet on it at some point next week. But and I again, imagine this, it, Indiana will be favored in that game. They might be. It, it may come down to how well they handle Western Illinois. And by the way, speaking of them, we're not going to talk really about that game in general because there's no reason to, at least the matchup itself. Indiana should take care of business and win this game by a large margin, probably somewhere in the 40s to zero. There's no reason that this team should, should score on you. They were 0-11 last year. They got the doors knocked off of them by Northern Illinois in week one. And this is literally just a game to kind of practice with. And I, I hate to sound like I'm taking them lightly. You want to make sure nobody gets hurt in this game. You want to make sure you win the game, of course. You don't want to look ugly. You, this is this is a, a time to polish everything before you go on the road to play UCLA in week three. And that's all I really have to say about that. You can add to it if you want to, but there's really not a whole lot really that comes to that game specifically other than take care of business and stay healthy. You're exactly right. This is a take care of business game. You are you open up the playbook a little bit. You expect not perfection. Nothing's ever going to be perfect. Yeah. But with the quality of opponent, because if you look back at Western Illinois history, and the only reason I know this is best man in my wedding played quarterback there when okay. I was in school. So I've followed him a little bit. Fun they fact. went on a good run for the last three or four years. I think they've at most won one game in a season. Like they, not just last year, they were 0 and 11. They've been 0 for repeatedly. That's a program that's trying to find something, anything to latch on to. <clears throat> Indiana needs to come out and win by five or six touchdowns. Like early. That your quarterback should not be in the game in the fourth quarter. And you should be Taven Jackson from really midway through the third onward. I, I agree. This is, I think the expectations for the first game were go out there, handle your business. There's a lot of change. Bullets are flying different. It's the first time for the team. Let's go out and just control the game. I think the expectations shift a little bit for week two, no matter what happened in week one, uh, that you make a bunch of improvements. It's a much lesser opponent. You have to go out there and dominate them physically. 300 yards rushing. I don't think we need like 500 yards passing just because I don't think we'll get there in that game. But this needs to be a three or 400 yard rushing game. They need to have less than 10 first downs. Like there are there are numbers that you're looking for to call this a success. 28 to nothing doesn't does not do that for me. You you need to go out and smoke these guys and get ready to go out to Los Angeles, probably be favored, and beat a team that you're probably a lot better than. Um, not that you're looking ahead. We get the we get to do that. We're not on the team. Right. We can look ahead as far as we want. We get the leeway to – we can talk about Ohio State if we wanted. Those guys are going to be focused in. Western Illinois is going to be the most important thing. We talked about football robots. Signetti will not allow it to be the other way, it seems. Uh, that just seems to be his personality that even if you even mention UCLA, he'd try to fight you or something. Uh, so I expect him to go out and do exactly what um, exactly what they need to do. And then the, this, I want, we're at 20 minutes or so. I don't know how long you want to go with this. We can go a few more minutes. I want to talk, because this, you know, we're in Twitter season here. We're in Twitter <laughs> season. And it's something we talked about uh, the other day. I was on a different show. And how disappointing it is that the fans leave the game. Now, I understand 
program's been bad. They've had a lot of trauma. Blah, 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 blah. That's all I hear. It's dumb. I'm tired of people saying that, you know, like, oh, well, win some games and then we'll come. We'll come for the bigger games. Uh, it was just FIU. Bull crap. You think Oregon didn't have – wasn't thankful that they had 85,000 playing Idaho, who, a team who Indiana, with the roster they had last year, beat by 40? Like that – or maybe that was two years ago. Whenever it was. Either way, yeah. Like the last two seasons of Indiana football have been disgraceful. They beat – they even beat Idaho by a zillion. Idaho goes in to Oregon and has them on the ropes. It's just Idaho. You're the number three team in the country. That stadium is filled to the brim until the last snap of the game. And you watch – I mean, it's different standards of football, I understand. But you watch all these games, all these teams that are trying to do something different, especially teams in a position like Indiana that – if we want to talk about, we can talk about all kinds of things, right? We can talk about the wide, big picture. If the Big Ten continues to do what they're doing, the SEC continues to do what they're doing, we're moving to two super conferences. This is what fans need to understand. Indiana, whether they like it or not, is on the outside looking in when there's when you talk about two super conferences and staying in one of those conferences. Because money comes from football. Basketball is nice. It's fun. People like it, especially here, but it's not what drives the TV contracts. And when Indiana doesn't put a product on the field that brings in money, they start getting farther and farther down the list of priority for the Big Ten Conference. So now let's go back to what we saw on Saturday. You haven't had a winning team in two years, you have a brand new coach. You're winning the game comfortably. That in itself, enjoy. why can we not enjoy that? You paid for the seats. The stadium was pretty no. full in the first half. You paid to go to the game. Just stay. That's simple. I'm not asking you to catch a pass, right? Just sit in the seat. We don't even have to talk about them knowing how to cheer or being loud or anything like that. <laughs> Just sit in the seat. It's the perception, and there's two reasons for that. One, as a player, coming out in the second half and seeing it empty is about as demoralizing as you can. Like, you cannot it is imagine. Weird, man. It is weird. Cannot weird. imagine how demoralizing that is after you just had a halftime speech. You're talking about all these adjustments. You're fired up. You cannot wait to play again. And the stadium is 40% as full as it was. You cannot imagine how demoralizing that is for a player. Now, we talked about the future, the future of the Big Ten Conference. That's all in recruiting, right? Transfer portal makes it a lot easier to get new guys, but – a program that's going to be sustained for a long term and longevity has really good high school recruiting classes. Like the university of Miami had the best transfer portal class. They talk about all these transfers, but when you look at the last two years, they went into Florida and won by 40. You look at the last two years, they've had top five high school recruiting classes too. So you think about these high school kids that Indiana works really hard to get to the game, really hard to get to the game. You're Joe Schmo. You're watching Indiana. You call yourself a fan. You buy tickets to the game. You sit there in the first half. You leave at halftime. Indiana wins. You don't think anything of it. But there's some recruit. Who knows? There's four-star recruits at those things all the time. This Julian Lewis kid who everybody's all excited about, if he's at the game, he stays for the whole game, whether you stay or not. So he sees what happens in the second half. He sees how demoralizing, and I'm going to continue to use that word because that's exactly what it is, that stadium is in the second half. It, it shows that fans are not invested. You can tweet at these recruits. You can act all excited. When things are going bad, they're so quick to point the finger. Oh, the coach sucks. Quarterback sucks. We can't block. We blah, 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 blah. But then when it's time to do one little thing, that your only job as a fan is to sit in the stands. Sit there. You don't have to be loud at all. The Usually it's loud because of a couple people in each section. That stadium is built to be loud. And it's been loud when there's a 1,000 people in there. And I know that because we played Ohio State and had an onside kick to tie the game. And there's a 1,000 people in the stands. It's about as loud as I ever heard it. So I know it gets loud. 
all we need these people to do is sit there. And I had a really hard time on Twitter because I've called it out a little bit. And I think there's some former players that were also calling it out a little bit. But it's amazing to me how quick fans are to point the finger. Again, coach sucks. Quarterback sucks. Blah, blah. Quarter program. Can't do anything. We'll never win. But then as soon as it's time to look themselves in the mirror and say, wait, maybe I can actually help the program in a much bigger way than I understand and can comprehend. A million excuses. It's just FIU. Well, the court program has been terrible. We're, ba we're basketball fans. Look at basketball. Or think about 2020. We won four games. Now talk to me in week five. No, there's recruits at every game. It doesn't take long. This is The whole program sucks thing doesn't make sense to me because I feel like you could say that per regime. If you're basing that off yes. of what happened in the Tom Allen era, that's done. Yes, it happened, but that has nothing to do with what's going on now with the program. Nothing. And with the transfer portal, you can become a prominent program in what feels like 10 seconds. So this isn't something that, oh, well, just wait. This takes – it's a long – I think somebody tweeted at me. It's a long with 10 O's process. No, it isn't. Just buy the ticket, sit <laughs> on the bleacher for three hours. They've got good food. They've got beer in there. And they've really improved. The the, I know I haven't been there myself yet. They've added a lot of new stuff. Oh, my year. God. The game day experience is one million times better than it was even when I was there. You've got a beautiful stadium in a beautiful part of the country. You're watching one of maybe the best or second best conference football at the college level every week, week in, week out. And you've got a program that can do some unbelievable things. They've been given so many resources internally to turn that thing into a real, a real program. I don't know. I, I'm hesitant to say powerhouse because who knows, but they have so many resources and Bloomington is so easy to recruit to. It's so easy. And fans don't understand how much value they have on game day. There are t usually six Saturdays. You call yourself a fan. This, eight, year we this, got, year. this year we got lucky. We got eight Saturdays. That is 24 hours for an entire year that you get to sit in the stadium and cheer on the Hoosiers. How hard is that, John? That is not it's very not hard. hard. We're not I've never been you. to a game unless the team – and I'm not even just talking about Indiana, but any game, any sporting event that I attend, the only time that I ever leave early is if the team I'm cheering for is getting their ass kicked and it's over. If you're up, I don't understand the reason to leave early. In what I think that when do you leave? I watched, I'm a big Miami. Definitely fan. not at halftime. If that's, that's and that's the biggest problem with Indiana. Most that's people leave win or lose some point during the fourth quarter or the second half, whatever sport you're watching. That's when most people, I feel like, typically leave a game if you don't stay the whole time. I, I've never <laughs> – hold on. Shout out to uh, Mitchell's dog, Frank, who is getting a little rambunctious in the background. I think he's listening to me get a little excited. And I think I feel like <laughs> I'm yelling a little bit, but it's so frustrating. We've done this for so long, and this is a brand-new landscape of college football. Everything's going to happen so quickly. The fans need to understand that they better change quickly, too, because if you don't, we're going to be in the Mac. That's a fact. We're enjoy your time in the Big Ten now. You want to continue to leave. You want to continue to not support the program. You want to continue to not help recruiting. You want to continue to not be loud and make Indiana a hard place to play because it can be. We're tricky. We're a team not a lot of other Big Ten teams want to play. Whether you want to believe it or not, you can say the program hasn't been good. I can, that, I know that, that argument, if someone's making that argument, I know I said it earlier, that shouldn't count for anything. It, yeah, it's just it's disgusting. But if you like doing all this, if you like playing Ohio State, if you like thinking we're, you know, you get to pound your chest, we're a Big Ten team in the new Super Conference. If you like that, you better start coming to the game because things can happen really quickly. Uh, as soon as you stop providing, what have you done for me lately? And again, that's all football. Nobody cares about basketball when it comes to money and TV contracts. Basketball don't make no money. 
It's all football. You better start coming to the game. You better start staying. You better start being loud because it matters way more than you think. And I, I feel like I'm at wit's end with it, man. It's it's a new era of college football, and we better get with the times. And we'll see. Um, I don't really know what to expect from a Friday night in Bloomington against yep. an FCS team that's terrible. I would I'd like to think students will show out again, especially if the weather's nice. Everyone else, I guess it's up in the air. But the real the first telltale sign on if things really begin to improve, I feel like will be after the UCLA result. Because and again, the opponent after that is Charlotte. It's not anybody to write home about. But if you get that win on the road in Los Angeles, you have reason to think this could be a fairly special season. I'd love to see what the crowds look like after that. Agree. Friday nights are hard. Uh, Tom Allen said a lot of stuff. One of the smartest things he ever said is that's high school night. And I, 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 <laughs> I'm going to backtrack the last seven minutes of me yelling at you, the listener, to go to the, <laughs> go to the game. Uh, Friday nights are hard, and it's so stupid that they play football on Friday. The reason they it's play football. It's all TV on, thing. It's all TV. It's money. It goes back to, I backtracked a little to then hit you again. We have Friday night games because there's so much money in TV. We can have 18-team conferences. We can do all these amazing things. We can have NIL because of how much money there is. People care about it that have so much money. It's silly. It's completely different than any sport in college sports for sure. It's starting to get closer and closer to the NBA. It'll probably be something like the NBA in terms of money uh, for TV rights. Who knows? Maybe it's even there already. I don't know exactly what the numbers are. Uh, it's professional football. And time waits for no man and no program. Just because we've been in the Big Ten from the beginning, don't mean we're going to stay in the Big Ten forever. The Pac-12, teams that have been in the Pac-12 since the beginning, now there's two They're on an island by themselves right now, Washington State and Oregon and State. Didn't even see, it came out of nowhere. Nowhere. They finished one season thinking we want to play in the Pac-12, we want to win the Pac-12, to the next season, wait a minute, every team's gone out of the conference, now we're head is spinning. That can happen at the drop of a hat. And the fans play such a big part of it. We go out and we get Washington, we get UCLA, we get at USC, and we get Oregon because they're super popular and their stadiums are awesome. UCLA stinks as a program. Gutter. Makes Indiana look like the Kansas City Chiefs. They haven't been good in forever. But they've got fans that believe. They've got fans with a lot of pride. They have a bunch of people that watch the game. They have a bunch of people that go to the game. Do they? I don't know that they fill the Rose Bowl very well. I guess we'll see in a few weeks, but. It's a, a pro weeks. It's a program with proud tradition. Yeah. They have in the past. Now, whether they do now or not, I don't know the answer to that. But that's a program with really proud fans. That's why you go out and get them. They're going out and getting teams like that so they can start getting rid of some teams that don't have that. Um, and it doesn't know happen the really Big Ten, anywhere else. We'll wrap this up here in a second. I don't know that the Big Ten <laughs> is planning to remove teams. The only thing I fear happen. in the future, and I don't know that I truly fear this, but the only other thing I could see happening is if – either the Big Ten or the SEC started poaching teams from the other super conference. You know what I mean? That's the only thing I could potentially see happening in the future. In Indiana, unless unless it's the Big Ten poaching from the SEC, which I doubt, Indiana's not going to be one of the first and probably would be one of the last taken if the SEC was poaching teams from the Big Ten. Well, you've got a couple other conferences that are going to get eaten up, is the thing. That's The Big, the Big 12, 12 and ACC will go first. They're going to get eaten up. And... The Big Ten is trying to get national. They don't have any teams in Florida. They're going to go down there and try to get Miami. They're going to try to get Florida State. They're going to try to poach someone like a Georgia Tech, get something in Georgia. They're going to try to do all kinds of things. And this isn't going to be a conference with 30 teams. It just doesn't work. So somebody's going to have to go. You may not see it now, but think about how quickly everything changes in college football. You have to start understanding as a fan how important you are because this is not your mom and dad's college football. It just isn't. This is business. This is dollars. It is all dollars. It is driven by the almighty dollar. What have you done for me lately, Indiana? 
you just had a really confident, dominant win against an FIU team. You had a really full stadium, and then I take a picture in the second half, and I think there's 10 people in the stands. That looks really bad on TV. Really bad. Advertisers, they don't like that. They want yeah. beautiful images to show. We need people in the stands. Good conversation. Stands. Good yes. conversation. I'm furious image. about it, if you can't tell. But here, Indiana's going 12-0, and 0, right? You still have that mindset, right? Does, and the product on the field is it. They did exactly what they were supposed to do. If we talked about what I think about Indiana, how they handled their business, this could have been a two-minute conversation. What do we think about the team? They did exactly what I was hoping. And we'll do. see. Maybe it's a totally different. I mean, maybe we get to that Charlotte game and we have a full stadium for 95% of the game. We'll see. I hope, pray that we have a full stadium for 95% of the game. And players say, yeah, I don't really, I didn't really even notice. And then everyone, I'll give you my address. You can come beat me up and I'll be wrong. <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> but I promise that won't happen. Like it's. Yeah. All that's, it'll, all that it'll, it'll definitely, I mean, maybe again, I don't want to, we've already dug too much into the weeds. Maybe we'll revisit this in the future, depending we'll, on we'll how, visit how much it gets. Probably in week four. When hopefully we'll, I, I just hope we see improvement. It doesn't have to be an immediate change. I do think yes, there will, does. I, I wish it could be. I just don't think that's realistic. It because won't people be, aren't like but that. it needs to be. Yes. I'm with you on that. So with that being said, Mitchell Page, appreciate you as always. <laughs> Great. I, I'll take you 40 minutes every time if you want to. I don't I don't mind. <laughs> it their gets me all fired up, hot and bothered. For whatever reason this year, it's just every it's happened since I was there. But I played in a different era. It's you you just have to see how different the landscape is now. And it's so much what have you done for me lately? So it, it just feels so much more urgent. Sorry, I dominated the show with that. Oh my gosh. Uh, no, 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 no. It was honestly, it was a good half and half. We went yeah. from about and if 20 you disagree, minutes onward. Listeners, if you disagree, my Twitter handle, if you're watching, is right there. Come talk to me. I'm happy to talk to you about it. I obviously very, feel uh, very passionate about what I'm saying. So I can't promise you that I'll just say you're right. Uh, <laughs> He but won't. I can give you reasons why I think you're wrong if you have anything to say, <laughs> but you're at, that I'm correct. So, uh, oh man, well, good stuff. Good Hopefully, we could do this again every Sunday. I know, I know things get in the way sometimes. You got a baby, you got all sorts of stuff going on, but I'll, I'll love, I'm looking forward to the rest of the season. Hopefully, there's a lot of good things to talk about, especially with the team itself. And, uh, I'm excited. I'm glad the Kurt Signetti era is finally kicked off. Agree. I agree. I, I think there's going to be a lot of really fun things to look forward to on the field and hopefully in the stadium as well. Good stuff from Mitchell Page, as always. Very excited to have him on board with us each and every Monday throughout college football season as uh, he'll be around to give us his thoughts as the season goes on, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of twists and turns along the way, and uh, I'm excited to continue moving forward with football season. It's finally here. I'm glad that we finally got to see some stuff on the field and one thing I, I do want to mention this for those of you who may have watched the Hoosier Illustrated post game wrap up show, I said something during the show that I, I believe at the time I was kind of spinning my wheels. And looking back on it, for some reason, I've let it bother me for the last couple of days. And it's the fact that I said there wasn't a whole lot to be excited about, which is not true at all. I think what I was trying to get to whenever I mention that specifically, is that there really wasn't a lot of explosive plays. And again, because of the way that I was spinning my wheels during that, it was our first live production. I don't mean, I, I know, I realize that sounds like an excuse and it is, but for some reason I feel like I want to clear that up because I was very, I don't want to say I was embarrassed of myself because it's not really how I felt, but I was annoyed that that's the direction that I was taking it during the post-game wrap-up show, because there is a lot to be excited about. But the one thing that we really didn't see with the Indiana football team, especially with the offense, outside of really that outside of that 50-yard uh, burst by Elijah Green, we didn't see a, a lot of big play ability. And maybe that's something that will get developed over a few more games and throughout the Kurt Signetti tenure as a whole. But the one one of the things that was missing from this Indiana team over the weekend was kind of a big play ability. And that's what I was trying to get at whenever I said that there wasn't a lot to be excited about. So 
again, I'll get better under pressure. And I say that because it was just because it was live. And there was a moment during the post game show. And maybe I'm being a little too transparent, but I do believe in transparency. Um, but there was a moment during the post game show where I was really in my head for reasons that really don't matter. And uh, I'll get better at it. I'm looking forward to doing more of those with Kyler Staley and our friends at HoosierIllustrated.com. Uh, we'll probably get a little Dylan Traeger in throughout the season. One of our new staff members uh, we'll probably hear from Alec Lasley as well. And obviously, love, obviously, they'll be a part of this show, too. But it'll be nice to hear different live reactions from different people as we move forward into the rest of the season. So let's get into a few of the big results from week one, shall we? Um, one thing I want to point out, because other than... Other than there's there's a, there was a few upsets. Man, I feel like I'm I'm swerving all over my words this morning. I don't know if it's because it's it's Labor Day and I got to sleep in a little bit this morning. But I kind of feel like I'm all over the place. I need to slow down a little bit. Let's take a little let's take a little sip of this uh, brown sugar coffee here on a Monday. And if you're watching right now from work or at home, you can take a sip of your coffee right now too. Slow down a little bit. We only be going a million miles an hour just because we're doing a I almost said a radio show, but there's no radio affiliate with the show. So it's more of just a YouTube podcast. But a lot of good stuff from college football this weekend. And what I was going to get into is the biggest results from the week. I'd say the biggest piece of news in general is the fact that the SEC went one in three in their marquee matchups. And whenever you bill yourself as kind of the big bad conference of college football and you continue to not deliver in the non-conference, I don't believe you should get the benefit of the doubt the way that you always do when you get into conference play. So I'm going to pull up some of the SEC results that I'm talking about specifically just so I can reference them here. Um, obviously one of them being the big USC LSU game last night in Las Vegas and our friend Brian Kelly, I say friend, not really, but he's just kind of the college football goofball. He, he did something during his press conference that made me chuckle last night. And I want to play that here real quick for you. We had some guys played their butts off tonight and, and we're sitting here again. We're sitting here again, talking about the same things. And one thing I love about that, obviously, you can't see the visual, but if you look it up on Twitter or YouTube, you could definitely find it. But the way Brian Kelly channels his anger, you, you hear him pound the desk that he's doing the press conference on. But it seems so manufactured, you know? I think he realizes he's kind of under the gun a little bit. He's now 0-3 in, in, I guess it's kickoff games, whatever you want to call them, in season openers. I believe two of those losses came to Florida State, and now you have the loss to USC in Las Vegas. And the Brian Kelly era, I mean, it hasn't been terrible. I mean, it really hasn't been bad at all when it comes down to just wins and losses. But the overall expectation at LSU is to be able to compete for championships. And I'm not saying he can't do that, but he hasn't given LSU fans a lot to be excited about in, uh, in week one matchups specifically. So there, there's one of your losses from the SEC. And then what, what, what all, all else that you had when it comes to some of the upsets from that conference in particular. Notre Dame went down to Texas A&M and won 23-13. Miami went into Florida and won 41-17. to And then I believe that, that, that is all the uh, losses. And then the one win for the SEC – when it comes to power opponents that they were playing against was Georgia and Clemson. Georgia won that 34 to three. And by the way, I know I mentioned that I didn't get a lot of betting picks. Correct. I did get that one correct, but I parlayed it with the Indiana over. So that didn't get me anything. Uh, so that the only bet that I was able to get any winnings off of was that USC upset money line. So the sec, are they able to continue to toot their horn the way that they do when they continue to pile up losses like this in the non-conference. And I know it's only one week one, and you'll probably see them improve that margin 
throughout the year. I mean, maybe not, but we'll see. A lot of the other SEC teams took care of business against their non-power opponents. But let's let's move on to the Big Ten a little bit real quick, and then we'll get into a little bit of Indiana basketball talk to wrap things up. Here's a couple of the results from the weekend, uh, and here's another one. So I talked with some neighbors the other day, I, some neighbors that listen to the show. Um, shout out to them if they happen to be <laughs> watching right now. But I was walking my dog with some of our friends, and they were hanging out outside in their garage. And one of the guys calls out and says, your Michigan State pick cost me money last night. And I thought it was kind of funny. Um, it cost me money too, of course, but. The fact that some people were listening to my wagering picks, I'll, I guess I'll take that as a win, right? And again, hopefully you took USC money line. I don't know that I took you or told any of you all to take USC money line. That was kind of a last minute addition to my wagering. But uh, if you did, kudos to you. So other Big Ten results from the weekend of note. I don't know if any of you all watched that Oregon game with Idaho, but Oregon was on the ropes and it wasn't even so Dylan Gabriel had, I believe nearly a record type of a day, but they only won that game by 10 points and they kind of needed some late game heroics to knock off a, an FCS opponent in the Idaho Vandals. So very interesting, shaky start for Oregon. Penn state ends up beating West Virginia 34, 12 after a long delay in that game due to some weather, uh, so shout out to the Nittany Lions and Tom Allen for getting it done. Michigan took a while to demolish, or I should say dismantle. They didn't really demolish them. Took a while to dismantle Fresno State. Ended up winning 30-10. to 10. We finally saw some offense out of Iowa. They win the game 40-0. to zero. I believe that might be the most points they've uh, had in over a season, maybe two seasons. Uh but they, they were only up 6-0 at halftime and ended up scoring 34 points in the second half. So shout out to the Kirk ferentz list Iowa Hawkeyes, because he didn't coach in that game. Remember, he was suspended. I wonder if they'll be able to keep up the offensive prowess when he returns to the sidelines next week against the Iowa State Cyclones. Uh, Maryland. So that's a team, at least when it comes to of interest to Indiana, that we really didn't know what to expect coming into the year. And Indiana plays Maryland in week five. And Maryland took care of business against UConn with a brand new quarterback, Billy Edwards Jr. And they won 50 to seven. And so it's looking like they may be fairly formidable once again. We'll obviously keep an eye on that as we get closer to the Hoosiers matchup with the Terrapins. So that's something to watch. Purdue dismantled to Indiana State 49 to nothing. Hudson Card had a record day. I remember seeing he was 24 for 25 completions and that tied a record with one of the former Georgia quarterbacks from I believe 2018 um so don't really want to shout out the Boilermakers I'm not a Purdue fan but you know things happen good stuff for for them if you're happy about that Nebraska takes care of UTEP Northwestern was in a battle with a Mac opponent it seems like that is one of the more consistent traditions in the Big Ten is Northwestern struggling with someone that they shouldn't struggle with early on. And uh, another interesting game of note that I watched a good majority of this game, really from the second half onward, UCLA had to squeak out a victory against Hawaii on the road. They won 16-13, to and they were down, I believe, 10 to nothing or 10-3 to at halftime, if I remember correctly. And um, Deshaun Foster's squad not looking super sharp. And they have a bye week before Indiana comes to town in week three. And again, that game is looking more and more winnable. It is looking more and more um, like a, a pivotal moment. I, obviously, as we get closer, and you heard Mitchell and I kind of talking about that briefly earlier. And I'm sure we'll dive into that a lot more next week after Indiana takes care of Western Illinois. But UCLA, man, um, it could be. Could be it could be a long season for them. Maybe I'm overreacting that again. This is the type the, the time of year where we do overreact to results, especially after one week. So yeah, there you have it. And that'll do it with for kind of all the notable results. So we have yet to go over from week one. We'll talk more college football as the week rolls along. And we'll also talk a little more NFL. The NFL kicks off this week. And I uh, haven't done a whole lot of NFL talk so far this year. Obviously, most of this is 
you know, an Indiana based show, an IU based show, I should say, but this means we won't talk NFL, talk little Colts, talk really not, I mean, not even just the Colts, we'll talk all NFL, depending on what some of the storylines are. So we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit later this week as well. But now, as uh, you know, right before we wrap things up, I do want to mention, I know I kind of, kind of teased it at the beginning of the show. Um, Indiana basketball had a very important visitor in town for the Kurt Signetti opener, and that was one Jalen Harrelson from La Lu Prep School. And as we've talked about before, now that Indiana and Mike Woodson have missed out on the likes of Malachi Moreno, you know, each recruit becomes more important than the last if you continue to miss guys like that. So, and, and these are very different style of players, obviously. Malachi Moreno being a big man, Jalen Harrelson a guard. That is obviously not the exact same thing. So, uh, but in terms of the overall perception of the program, that's why eventually landing a couple of these guys is going to be of importance, especially when you think about the restless side of the fan base who just wants to see that there's work being done on the recruiting trail. Um, it was just good stuff from that, from, I guess the bird's eye view of all those types of things. But Jalen Harrelson's visit to Indiana was his first of several visits after this weekend. He now travels to Notre Dame on the seventh. He'll go to Michigan state on the 14th, Missouri on the 21st, Purdue on the 28th, in Kansas on this, or excuse me, October 19th. Um, so a lot to keep an eye on there. And one thing, if you remember when we chatted with Kyler Staley last week, one thing to really kind of pay attention to on whether or not Jalen Harrelson is kind of narrowing his decision is if you start to see him cancel visits. And so if none of that happens, then obviously we won't at least have anything until after October 19th. And um, funny thing about that date, I do believe that is right around when Hoosier hysteria is. I know that's right around when homecoming weekend is on the 2024 fall schedule. Let me take a look real quick and get a little confirmation just to see if that does line up with anything. But Hoosier hysteria 2024. So it's Friday, October 18th. I knew it was right around there. So, um, and again, these guys can take as many official visits as they want in this new uh, era of college basketball, if you will. So that means he could return for Hoosier Asteri. I doubt that'll happen if he's going to Kansas the very next day. Um, but maybe there's an off chance that Harrelson trims his list or cancels visits before then and makes a decision by that time. So there's no telling. Um, but he did post a kind of a recap highlight video on his Twitter page, his X page that hashtagged not committed, but also kind of showed all the things that he enjoyed about his visit to Bloomington. And there was a lot of stars, a lot of former Hoosiers in town for the for the Indiana football opener. Trace Jackson Davis was in town. Cody Zeller was in town. James Blackman Jr. And uh, maybe even a couple of guys I'm forgetting, but they had the the whole cavalcade of of stars, if you will, there for Jalen Harrelson, and I'm sure it was a fun weekend for him. But that's something we will keep an eye on as time goes by, I should say. And obviously, we'll keep an eye out on what happens with Braylon Mullins and Trent Sisley as well. Because the further we get into the fall, the closer, more likely, I should say, it is to uh, get a decision from those guys. So we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on it. And we'll also keep an eye on, on you. I don't know what I'm saying. Let's go ahead and wrap up this episode. This has kind of been all over the place for a Monday. Hopefully you enjoyed our my chat with, with Mitchell Page because I enjoyed recording that with him and look forward to many more of those throughout the season. And uh, well, we're also going to work on doing more shows with multiple guests so I'm not just here babbling and rambling and saying a bunch of nonsense. Sometimes I get into the nonsense and I can really embrace it for some reason this morning. Uh, I say morning. It's not necessarily the morning when you're going to view this. It's just the morning when I'm recording it. But uh, I want to be able to be the best version of myself for the show. So maybe today was just not one of those days for whatever reason. But I'm feeling good. I'm not saying I'm not enjoying this. Um, I just 
I want to be able to bring my best. And for some reason, I feel like I didn't bring my best today. And um, we'll just we'll leave it at that. And we'll be back on Wednesday. So be sure to check out everything going on on HoosierIllustrated.com. Appreciate you guys, as always. And I look forward to doing it again on Wednesday. Dylan Sim is going to join me to kind of recap all that went down with not just Indiana, but give me thoughts on Purdue and Notre Dame as well as all three programs off to a solid start after their week one performance. So looking forward to that conversation on Wednesday. Until next time, this has been an episode of In Touch with Indiana Sports, powered by HoosierIllustrated.com. We'll be back on Wednesday.